Okay, guys, a little bit of show and tell here. So we'll start off with these two wash these two motors here. One I have is a, uh, a washing machine motor, and this guy is a dryer motor. Um, so the funny story, or maybe not so funny story with this, is that uh, I, back in the day, had a number of investment properties, uh, and two of those properties were not paying the rent. So I ended up having three mortgages uh, for a long period of time. Um, and so we had to end up like selling our truck, and then I ended up having to bike to uh, to work, uh, and it was like minus ten, minus fifteen, and I was dying. Couldn't even afford a cup of coffee. So how does that tie in with these guys? Well, I got these from my neighbors. This is from their washing machine. This is from their dryer. Uh, so my neighbors knew I was hurting, and then they saw me biking to work at like minus fifteen, and then they saw me at like five in the morning with wrenches trying to take their motor out of their appliances, uh, out of the washing machine and the dryer. And they're like, dude, you are, you are hurting. Like, what's going on? They were like grabbing their kids and bringing them to the, to the window and saying, that's why you stay in school. Look at that guy. He's so hurting. He's taking appliances out of our motors out of our appliances. So I wasn't doing that because I was so desperate. I was trying to just have demonstration motors. So these are great for grabbing and, uh, and t passing around the room so everybody can see, um, you know, a single phase motor for a washer or for a dryer. So let's take a look at this guy. With this one, you can just make out, um, let's see if you can see with the phone, you can just make out that there's two different gauges of wire. You can see, see this winding right here on the inside there. Uh, so that's one gauge of wire. And then there's another gauge of wire here. And you can see it a little bit better here in that this is a smaller gauge of wire and this is a larger gauge of wire. So one is the start winding and one is the, uh, the run winding. So you can see that that, by having two different gauges of wire, you can tell that it's a sing single phase motor. Um, you can also tell it's a single phase motor uh, because of the centrifugal switch. So centrifugal switch is right here. So you can just make out the centrifugal switch right here. This bad boy right there. Um, and so as the motor gets up to speed, then it's going to uh, obviously rotate. And then that contact right there is going to uh, move open and close. So can't do it with my uh, my phone in my hand at the moment, but it has a centrifugal switch that can open and close. Let's take a look at the uh, the dryer and see if you can see it. There's the centrifugal switch right there. Focus, um, and you can see that there's a spring there. And I've got another unit right here. So on the inside, it looks like this, and that centrifugal switch is right here. So once this guy gets up to speed, then it pulls back and opens up the contacts. And the contacts that are sitting on the end bell, so you can see that it springs back once it stops spinning. But those guys would push down on a set of contacts. So an example set of contacts are these guys right here. And so that centrifugal switch, or the plastic there, pushes down on these bad boys right here. And these allow current to either make or break to the start winding. Okay, in addition to, uh, to that, you can see that there's definite pulls on the motor. Like you can see here that I can actually see the pulls here. And if I flip it over, then you'll be able to see another set of pulls there. Uh, so on a single phase motor on either this washer or on this dryer motor, you can tell the actual windings there. On a three phase motor, which I'll show you in a little bit, it's very hard to actually see the actual like pulls on the unit there. But here we can see them definitely. So centrifugal switch, and the fact that we have two different gauges of wire um, tells us that uh, it's a single phase motor. Could also have uh, a capacitor. So this one is smoked, but uh, on the top of the unit, you'll have this bulge that's on top of the motor and that contains the capacitor for the unit there. Some single phase motors contain a capacitor, some do not. The capacitor provides us with either more starting or more running torque. It's a healthy uh, capacitor with the stake on connectors on the end here. So healthy in that it's not bulging, it's obviously not exploded like this one right here. Um, and it gives you like the microfarad, this one's a two, 189 to 227 microfarads at 110. So um, that unit right there will be mounted on the top of a, some single phase motors as well. Here you can definitely see the poles on the single phase motor, right? Whereas here on the three phase motor, you don't have to have different gauges of wire. And it's very hard or not impossible to see where the pulls start and where they end on the unit. So on a single phase motor, you're gonna see different gauges of wire. 
Uh, and you're going to see definite pulls on the motor, on the stator. On a three-phase motor, you don't need to have different gauges of wire, and it's, it's almost impossible to figure out where the windings start and where they stop. The cores for each of these guys are identical. They have the laminated steel here on the center, right? This bad boy over here has a laminated steel as well. So that's to stop any heating on the actual core. And then obviously we've got the insulation here to stop the conductors from chafing against the, the core of the unit there. Another stator from a pump. And here you can tell that the definite poles on the unit, you can tell the definite gauge difference between the start and the run winding. Here, if I zoom in again, you can make out, just make out the laminations on the unit there and the, um, and the mylar plastic to stop it from uh, chafing against the unit. The, these windings will actually move around, right? Because they're gonna get 60 hertz that's placed onto it. So they do bounce around. You just can't see that they're actually moving. But on a single phase motor, you can definitely make out the poles on the unit and the different gauges of wire. Okay, single phase versus three phase rotors here. Um, so on this guy, you can tell that it's a single phase because there's that centrifugal switch right here, the centrifugal switch. So as the motor gets up and running, they say about like 75% of the speed, then this, the centrifugal force is going to force this back and open the contacts to the start. Then when the motor slows down, then the spring action closes that guy, closes the contacts to the start and allows the current to get to the start so you can change direction uh, on the motor. Right, this one incorporates uh, some fan portion to the uh, to the aluminum, and here you can see that the um, the the rotor conductors are embedded within the steel, whereas this guy, the rotor conductors are on the uh, the outside here. This one's a single phase because it incorporates the centrifugal switch. Uh, this guy here is a three phase because it does not have a centrifugal switch. Right, it just has the conductors that go from the shorting rings, right? So big ass um, aluminum conductors that go to each one. And then um, you can see that this one has, if anybody has this answer, this one has different letters that are on the outside of this rotor. And I have no idea what those letters actually mean. Uh, but this one, or the single phase, uh, the thing to note is that there's no conductors that need to be brought to these units, right? These are the secondary of the transformer and they get all of their power from the stator of the unit. But single phase with the centrifugal switch and three phase rotor without centrifugal switch. Still going with uh, show and tell. Uh, this is from my, uh, my neighbor's fan. <laughs> uh, so it's in, again, you can tell the different gauges of wire on the unit. You can just make out the poles on the single phase fan motor. This one does not incorporate a, centrifug a centrifugal switch. Usually smaller motors don't incorporate a centrifugal switch. You can make out the laminations on the core here. And if we take the, the rotor out, then this one will keep the start winding in the circuit. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. That's a little bit less efficient if you keep the start winding in the circuit. But there you can see the aluminum conductors on the top there and they go to the shorting rings on either side. So in the transformer action, this bad boy is the primary and that induces a voltage onto the secondary. So as this magnetic field rotates around the outside of the stator, then it cuts across the rotor, induces a voltage onto the rotor, and then we get currents that flow from one side to the other. Those circulating currents create their own magnetic field and then chase after the magnetic field that created it on the outside. Single phase motors, the maximum you're gonna get is maybe like a five horsepower motor, right? Like this one, this one right here um, is so heavy, right? And this one's only a half horsepower. So imagine what a five horsepower single phase motor is gonna look like. And then everything gets bigger, right? The centrifugal switch gets bigger and everything. The currents to the start winding get bigger. So maximum, maximum you're gonna get on a single phase motor is gonna be five horsepower. And a couple more before we get to the wiring diagrams and everything. So on the inside, the rotor looks like this, right? So it has these uh, aluminum conductors that go to the shorting rings, right? The rings are all the way around there. And there's no wires that come out of this thing, right? Remember that this, this gets its power from the primary. This is this, this guy within the steel core is the secondary of the circuit there. And in this case, they've incorporated a fan portion to the rotor.
Okay, so usually cast aluminum uh, uh, rotor. This one here is a, a single phase motor because you can just make out where the centrifugal switch was. And this one's kind of cool. A previous teacher has cut this guy open and you can see the inside of the unit. So you can see the gauge of wire here. So that's at least a number 10, right? That's, so that's a lot of current that's gonna flow on these guys, right? You can see that it's a beefy conductor on the inside. So lots of current's gonna flow on this rotor circuit here. It doesn't flow outside of the rotor circuit. Like it's not gonna escape out through the casing of the motor. It stays on the path of least resistance, right? So the current's gonna flow on this portion of the circuit. It's not gonna escape out of the unit. Uh, but it's cool because you can see the actual rotor conductors on the inside here. Okay, another thing to see here um, is another, again, probably the same guy back in the 70s, um, has ground this out here. Uh, and you can see the conductors on the inside of the unit. Some of the conductors are gonna be straight like this. Other conductors, there's different rotor designs. So other rotor conductors will be uh, skewed so that as the, the rotor spins, that it maintains that torque on the unit there. So hopefully that gives you like an understanding of the difference between single phase versus three phase uh, rotors different gauges of wire that you'd see on the single phase motor uh, and different components that you'd see on single phase versus uh, three phase. Okay, so enough with the show and tell. Let's get to uh, the diagrams for this particular motor that we're going to wire up. Okay, so now we've gone through all the components after looking at the show and tell there. Uh, so we essentially have um, the, mo the motor casing, right? You have your end bells here or what they call the end plates. There's always going to be some fan component to this guy as well, right? Whether it's part of the rotor. So we saw part of the rotor bringing a fan component in there. We want to have as much air going past here to keep these conductors cool and these bad boys cool as well. Uh, we found the rotating switch or what we call the centrifugal switch. Or what I like to call the centrifugal switch. Um, and essentially, what else? We've got um, a capacitor in the circuit, possibly, right? Maybe there's two. Maybe there's one for start, and maybe there's one for run. There are going to be different capacitive values. Um, so in our shop, we have a start winding. We do not have a run winding on our components, okay? Uh, so capacitor housing is up here, and then everything that we hook up is going to be in this condo box. And all the information for this guy is going to be on the nameplate there. Okay, so that takes care of everything. The main thing that we saw on the single phase motor uh, was two components. The centrifugal switch, which is needed to bring the start winding in and out of the circuit. And we're going to go over that in detail. And then for more torque at the startup or while it's running, then it's going to need a capacitor. Okay, three phase motors do not need a, a centrifugal switch and they do not need a capacitor. They just create torque through the current flowing through the, state, through the stator windings. Okay, so the motors that we are hooking up in the shop are dual voltage single phase motors. So you can see right here that uh, it has two different voltages that it's gonna run off of. Now, this isn't the motor that we have in the shop. Um, I couldn't get a photo of that, but this is an example of a dual voltage single phase motor, right? So we can see here that we have the capacitor on the top here. This nameplate would be shown right here. And we can clearly see that there's two different voltages that this motor is going to run off of. If it runs off of 115 or 120, now remember that it says 115, but that corresponds to 120. They're saying 115 because it allows for any voltage drop from the panel to this motor. So they know it's a 120 volt circuit, but they've engineered it so it will work off of uh, 115. They know it's going to be 240 or 208. Uh, so if it's a 240 volt supply, then they're saying 230. They're accommodating that voltage drop on the conductors. You're also going to see uh, that the same power values are available here, right? Single phase power is that um, power is equal to voltage times current, right? So uh, if the voltage is lower, then the current draw is gonna be higher. So lower voltage, higher current draw. If 
for the same amount of power or the same amount of horsepower. Okay, if the voltage is higher, then the current that the motor draws is going to be lower. Okay, other things to take, while well, we have the, the nameplate here, let's take a look. Uh, 1725, that corresponds to 1800 RPM. Okay, that value of the 1800 RPM is going to be for the stator, the outside. The 1725 is going to be for the rotor. The rotor never catches up to the stator, right? So the, this is our primary and this is our secondary of the circuit. So in this case, we'll go over this in de more detail when you come back for advanced, but this is a four pole, four pole motor. Two pole motor is going to be a 3600 RPM. Four pole motor, the amount of magnets that are on the stator uh, corresponds to so more poles, corresponds to a slower speed at 1800 RPM. Okay, we can see here that we got 60 hertz because we're in North America, uh, and this guy is single phase. Uh, what else can we see? Power factor is 73, not great. So the efficiency of this motor is not great. Single phase motors aren't, they're not that great in terms of, uh, in terms of efficiency. Obviously a three phase motor would be way more efficient than a single phase motor. Um, what else do we have? We have the fact that it is usable at 208 volts. Well, that's good because we're gonna wire it up to 208. So it the nameplate says 230, but it is usable at uh, 28. Okay, um, what else do we have here? The only other thing that would uh, interest us at the moment would be uh, this guy right here, the service factor. That's for the sizing of any overloads that we need to, uh, to bring in, okay? You'll go over this in more detail, like the, the, the code and stuff like that for, um, for inrush current and stuff like that. Um, and what TEFC stands for, and then like frame size and, and everything. So it gives you everything, like including the bolt placements here for this unit. Okay, but main things that we're looking at are that for this motor, there are two voltages that this motor can run off of. Why would that be? Okay, so that would be because the manufacturers, in this case, Baldo or Reliance, can make the same motor and sell it to two different electricians that are gonna put this guy in to two different situations. One where they have a 120 volt supply, one where they have a 240 or 28 supply. So they don't have to make two different motors for two different voltage sources. They can make the same motor and then it's up to us to connect it up in either series or parallel, talking about the run windings. The run windings are wired up in either series or parallel to accommodate uh, this source voltage and have a, the specific voltage dropped across the run windings to provide us with the same horsepower regardless of what uh, our source voltage is. So the beauty of this is that Baldor is able to create one motor that services a number of different situations out in the field. Okay, taking a look at the uh, the wiring for this guy, it looks like uh, line one comes into terminal number one, three, and eight. So those guys are parallel together. We're going to see on the next diagram how that works out. Uh, line two goes into four, five, and two, and that's for the lower voltage, right? So the lower voltage means, in this case, 120 volts. The higher voltage, whether it's a 2.8 or a 240, then the connections will be line one to terminal number one, line two to terminal four and five, and then aside from these connections to our source, then we got three, eight, and two that are gonna be jumpered together. Okay, we're gonna see on the next, uh, the next image, one of these guys, it says for the low voltage line one and line two, one of those is gonna be the neutral. I'm gonna say maybe this guy right here is most likely gonna be the neutral, right? So that will be our 120 volt supply. Then on this guy, this is going to be our 2.8. So now we're grabbing the two single phase bus to give us 2.8. Or if you have 2.40, then that's your, um, like, if you have a single phase value, then that's going to be 2.40. If you have a three phase panel, then your single phase value between two of your line conductors is going to be 208 volts. Okay, so um, what I should have done was I should have put these side by each, but let's take a look at uh, the next image here. So I'm going to put the link for where I got this image. This is a phenomenal write-up on uh, single phase motors. Um, so this will be in the comment section. Awesome. And I've been looking for like years, I've been looking for a decent uh, diagram. 
like this. Okay, so for this one, it looks like for the low voltage, low voltage, same, if you were just watching the videos, like if you're just coming to my channel and you just uh, started watching this, we just did a bunch of uh, videos on, uh, on transformers and different windings on transformers. And the lower voltage, so lower voltage, is always gonna equal parallel. Okay, so here we have a parallel connection of our one run windings, okay? So we have run winding A and run winding B. There are two run windings, and that's what gives us the capability to hook this guy up to two separate voltages. For the lower voltage, in this case, 120 volts, always connect this guy up in parallel. Remember in parallel, voltages are identical. So if we have 120 volts right here to here, then we have 120 volts right here, and we got 120 volts right here. Okay, and on the stator winding, um, sorry, stator start winding, we also have uh, 120 volts, possibly. They say 120, but there's a capacitor. This, like, this is a rabbit hole right here, uh, that portion of the circuit. That's an RLC circuit in series. So we're gonna get into that, maybe possibly in detail. But let's keep it simple. Lower voltage always means parallel, in this case, our lower voltage is 120, okay? So uh, one, eight, and three go together. One, eight, and three go together. I love it when two different diagrams actually make sense and they match each other. Uh, the next one, two, four, and five go together. Two, four, and five go together. Very nice. So that's our lower voltage or the 120 volts, okay? For us, our higher voltage is going to be 2.8 volts because we have a three-phase uh, supply in the shop. So line-to-line -line voltage is 2.8, line-to-neutral voltage is 120. Okay, so lower voltage is always going to be the parallel connection, which means that higher voltage is going to be the series connection. Okay, in this case, we're gonna do 208 volts as our source, but the nameplate also said that it's gonna work off of 240 volts. Okay, if you're, if you're a little bit confused on these guys, th this value right here corresponds to a three-phase panel. This value right here corresponds to a single-phase panel, both of them being between line one and two, two and three, or one and three in the panel, okay? Here, this 240 volts would just be between line one and line two in a single-phase panel. Okay, so this means that we have to hook this guy up into, um, in this case, a 240 volt circuit. And that means that in a series circuit, like if we do this, right? If we took a two resistors and we put a 240 volt supply across that guy, that means that Kirchhoff, our buddy Kirchhoff says that 120 volts is gonna be dropped across those guys so that 120 plus 120 gives us 240. In our shop, we have 28, so that means that on our windings, we're going to have 208 volts as a source, and that means that equal voltage, because these windings have the same resistance, the same inductance, they're basically the same, two run windings, uh, so that means that they're gonna have equal voltages that sum to give us our source voltage. So in our case, we're gonna have 104 volts dropped across each of those guys. Beauty. So for us, we're going to say, all right, we have a 208 volt supply, and that means that these guys are going to be 104 volts, and this is going to be 104 volts, summing to give us our 208 volts out. Okay, so lots to cover in this video. This is actually one of my, this is probably my favorite lesson. I really enjoy this lesson. Um, so there are 10 different terminals that are available on your board, okay? There are more terminals on your on your board in the shop than there are out in the field. Out in the field, there are one, two, three, four, five, six connections that we need to make use of. Here, we have 10 different connections. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 different connections that we need to make use of, okay? Two of them are gonna to correspond to the run windings, right? Run winding A and run winding B. Then we've got the certificate switch, 
and we got two for the capacitor and then two for the start winding as well. So now I'm going to go back to the shop. I'm going to show you a quick video on taking ohmic values. And then from the second station, I'm going to come back to this diagram and we're going to correspond the values that we saw on the ohmmeter to the specific components that we see here for uh, our parallel connection. So when you're doing the shop projects, you have to first figure out which terminals on these 10 correspond to these components. Then we ask you to hook it up in a 120 fashion. Then we ask you to hook up in a 2.8 fashion. Then we ask you to do a handoff auto switch with the float switch. And then we get you to reverse the motor in the 120 volt configuration and reverse the motor with the six point drum switch in the two weight volts. But first step is to figure out what all these 10 terminals correspond to on this diagram and the components in the single phase motor. So let's go to the shop now and take a look at that. So I'm gonna show you two stations here, guys. I had to do a voiceover because the audio in the shop was brutal. And the lighting looks pretty bad as well. Um, so this is gonna be the first station and then I'm gonna show you the second station. So two stations with different values uh, for each of the different components. So they're obviously two different motors. They're also been used by different like class after class after class and you guys blow these things up all the time. So some of, it could be the exact same motor but the windings have been smoked from one class to the next. So this is our first station here. And uh, I'm gonna walk, press play, walk through, and I'll do like a voiceover showing you like what these values are corresponding to these terminals right here. Again, there are 10 terminals. They've all been ripped out of the, uh, the motor. There are way more terminals than you would see out in the field. So we've brought out the centrifugal switch, the capacitor, each of the, the run windings and the start windings. So they're all 10 right here. And it's up to you to figure out based off of these readings, what the values correspond to. Now this station you'll see sucks because the start and the run winding are so close uh, together. So I'm for the example that I'm gonna do with for the diagram with the resistance readings, I'm gonna take the next uh, values from the next station. But let's walk through this one uh, right here. So putting the meter leads onto the terminals and then looking for continuity. Okay, beauty, now I got continuity. I got minus 2.3 mega ohms, and if I flip the polarity, I got 12 mega ohms. So that's definitely the capacitor. Okay, now I'm looking for another component here. So it looks like between two and three, I got 3.2 ohms. Then between these two terminals right here, I got 0.3, that's the centrifugal switch, right? If it's a really, really low value, centrifugal switch. Okay, there's 3.2 again. So remember that on this motor, there's two run windings and look at this sneakiness. Oh, this one's three. So that one there is uh, is the start. So be careful uh, in, that, in that this last value right here uh, is so close to the run winding that was right before, right? So there was our run winding at 3.2. The other, the other run winding was 3.2 and then full out sneakiness the last terminals down here are going to be uh, three ohms here. There we go, there's our three ohms there. So that last value there is for the start winding. You're looking for a value that is different than the two run windings. Okay, let me show you the other uh, station. I went through the, I seem to have gone through the terminals a little bit too fast. Um, but let me go through the next station and what I'll do is I'll, I'll stop and start it as we go. And then we'll make a, well, as we go during the, the video, you'll make a note of each of the different terminals. And then we'll go through how each of those resistance values correspond to the, the different components in the motor. Okay. So this is the second station. Do me a favor. Don't write on the unit, right? This doesn't help the next guy. Uh, and it looks awful later on. So um, again, all the terminals have been brought out. So we've got centrifugal switch, we've got capacitor, we've got two run windings, and we've got a start winding. And right now we're on the ohmic setting of the meter here. So let's take a look here now. So looking for continuity, nothing between those guys. Okay, there, uh, between one and three, I have 0.3 ohms. So what do you think that is? That's gotta be the centrifugal switch, right? The centrifugal switch is just a switch. 
So it's like a piece of wire that you're, you're looking across with the ohmic value. So it looks like at this case, one and three is the centrifugal switch, okay? With authority, we know for sure it's the centrifugal switch. Okay, now I'm looking for something that goes with number two. Okay, so this one's pretty good in that the terminals are, aren't completely uh, mixed up. So it looks like uh, two and four are giving me 6.7 ohms. Okay, at that point, could be a start winding, could be a run winding. If we see another value that's 6.7, then this is a run winding. If we don't see another value at 6.7, then this is the start value. Okay, let's keep going. So we have the centrifugal switch, and now between two and four, we're debating uh, which one this is, start or run. Okay, now the next one. Okay, so that one that we saw before, right, where we saw this 6.7, that's gotta be the start, right? It has the higher resistance uh, so normally the start winding is going to have higher resistance, right? It's a more resistive load. Current goes to it uh, faster than the more inductive load. So the start winding gets the current first. So we're looking for a higher, usually, usually a higher resistance on the start winding. So this 6.7 is definitely our start winding. Once we take our leads off here and we go down and check here, now we've got a value that's a lot lower. That's 2.9 ohms. So that's going to be our run winding. We're going to confirm that if we see another two terminals that have something close to 2.9. Ah, yes, 2.8. Okay, right on. Remember, every class smokes these motors. So even the two run windings are not going to be exactly the same. From the manufacturer, there may be differences, but it's most likely that you guys have smoked them time and again. And so they may have a little bit of variation in the resistance. Now we have two values on two, se two separate pairs of, of uh, terminals here that have the exact same resistance values. So now we know that the 2.8, those values are gonna be our run windings. Okay, let's keep going and see what else we have here. I think we've finished everything. We haven't seen the capacitor yet though, right? Oh, very nice. There we go. Okay, so we got 32.85 mega ohms of uh, resistance. So that's definitely the, uh, the capacitor. Let's see if I flip the leads here on those two terminals and see if the value on the meter changes, but that's definitely the capacitor. Nice, okay, now we have a negative value. And you can see that as the meter is connected there, then the value on the capacitor is actually changing because I'm, I'm actually charging it up with the nine volt battery on the, uh, on the, uh, the meter. Okay, let's walk through that uh, one more time. Okay, just to make sure everybody's cool. And then we will correspond those to the different terminals uh, and we'll, um, we'll add it to our diagram that we had before. So 0.3 ohms, that's our centrifugal switch. Really low resistance. Now we got 6.7. We're not sure if that's a start or a run. Now we got three ohms. So now we know at that point that this is the run winding and the previous one was the start winding. Start will most likely have the higher resistance. And we'll confirm that this is the run winding when we see another two sets of contacts with 2.9 to you know, three ohms. Which we're seeing right here, nice. And then the last ones that we're seeing on the last two terminals there, that's our capacitor. 32.9 mega ohms, flip the polarity. We see mega ohms as well. We see that as the meter is in the circuit, it's actually charging up the capacitor. Beautiful. So now we've got all the components for these 10 terminals here. Again, not all those terminals are going to be available out in the field. It's just that we try and screw you up in shop class and slow you down to try and to, to try and understand the different components on the actual motor. All right, let's go back to the whiteboard and let's see how to wire this bad boy up. So let's put our 
labels here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Beautiful. And from that previous portion, we saw that one and three were 0 0.3 ohms. Okay, so very low resistance is going to be the centrifugal switch. Okay, all your values are going to be different. Some of the centrifugal switches have been smoked, right? Some are brand new. Next one, we have two and four, which was 6.7 ohms. This one worked out in that, like, it gives us nice, nice neat diagrams here. It, you could have had like one and eight as continuity. We've really screwed them up on some of the, uh, the trainers. Now, 6.7, we said was the start winding except for the first one that we looked at, the start winding is most likely going to have the higher resistance. Five and six have 2.9 ohms. Okay, so that is our run winding. I'm just going to arbitrarily say that's run winding number A. Then we've got uh, seven and eight, that is 2.8 ohms. Those guys are essentially the same. So that is going to be our second run winding. Again, this is a dual voltage single phase motor. And the reason why it is a dual voltage motor is because we have two separate run windings that we can connect up in either parallel or in series connections. Okay, last thing we need um, is the capacitor. We've talked about the fact that capacitors are not always needed. Like if you just have a fan or something, you may not need a capacitor. But if you need a pump, they need that, you know, that extra starting torque. Um, and I'm gonna leave that for another video as to like why the capacitor is in the circuit. Again, lots to talk about on that portion of the circuit there. Um, you could cover all of intermediate theory with this circuit. It has everything in it. Uh, 9 and 10 is, um, what was that, 32.85. This is like one way, right? If I change the, the meter leads, then I got another uh, value. But that was not 32.85 ohms. That was 32.85 mega ohms of resistance. So that is the capacitor. Beautiful. So those are all of our components there. Okay. Now we're going to hook this guy up. So now that we have all these, these values here, then we can, uh, we can hook them up and we're going to hook them up to the 120 volt source. So you have a disconnect on the left hand side. That disconnect has both 28 and 120 volts available. Um, and then you have terminals that correspond to the 28 volt source and the 120 volt source. So it goes from a disconnect to a manual starter to terminal blocks. So please call your instructor over if you're confused as to which voltage and which terminals correspond to that voltage. So we need one line, either line one in neutral or line two in neutral in order to make this guy work, right? So for this guy, we're gonna have uh, line one and neutral in order to do the parallel circuit there. Okay, beautiful. So some people complain about the fact that we've taken these out. They're like, why do you make this go so complicated? Um, well, you've seen here that we've been able to start at the beginning and then go, I don't know, this is probably like 25 minutes in on the video here, right? But now we have the ability to discuss every different component on the machine and you can diagnose that with an ohmmeter. Um, and I just, I, I feel that it really helps in order to understand all the different components and using your meter in order to discern whether things are good or bad, right? Whether the capacitor smoked, whether that centrifugal switch has been smoked as well, right? If you have a high resistance value on the centrifugal switch, then most likely the silver oxide on the on the cont contacts have been smoked. If the capacitor doesn't have uh, megohms value, then um, obviously that guy is smoked as well. Troubleshooting wise, that, those are the two components that are gonna go, right? The capacitor is the first thing you're going to look at. That's most likely the thing that's going to be smoked in the circuit. And then we have the centrifugal switch. That's the second thing. Very unlikely that the run windings are smoked. The third thing that might be smoked would be the start winding. Okay, so now we need to go over the parallel and the, uh, and the series connections here. So now that we've gone over these connections, um, and you're not writing this on the board, right? Don't be a dumbass and write this on the board. There's lots of groups that are coming through and this doesn't help anybody for you to put your answers on the board there. So you're writing this in your notebook, keeping track of this, and you're staying on the same station because all the stations are different. 
So if you do the low voltage one day and you come back to do the high voltage connection the second day, then make sure that you have reserved that station and you're going back to that same station. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, the low voltage connection now, guys. So you're connecting up to 120 volts and you're gonna put these guys in parallel. So that means that based off of this diagram, we're gonna put line one to one, three, and eight. Okay, so we've labeled, so those labels are uh, right here, right? So if we, let's take a look at these guys. So we have a one and two correspond, corresponding to run winding A. So this actually should be, this should be A and this should be B, okay? So one and two are gonna to correspond to run winding A. Three and four are gonna to correspond to run winding number B. Okay, so those guys have to be placed in parallel so that they get the same voltage across them. These windings, the two run windings and the start winding are only good for 120. You put 208 for, to that guy or this guy or this guy and you just bought yourself a new motor, okay? I know you didn't buy them, but I don't have any money left in the budget. Please don't smoke the motors, okay? 120 volts is the, the voltage capacity for the run windings and for the start winding. Okay, so that means that we've got, like if we look at like um, polarities here, then that means that current's gonna go from line one to neutral in both one to two for run winding number A and three to four on run winding B, okay? Then we need to hook up the centrifugal switch and the centrifugal switch controls the current. So this guy right here is really just a switch, right? It should be drawn like this, where we have a contact that opens once the motor gets up and running, right? When the motor is at, at rest, then that contact is closed. That's always in series with the capacitor, and the capacitor is in series with the start winding. So looking at our labels here, this is eight, and this is five. All of those guys, the centrifugal switch, the capacitor and the start winding are always in series and they're always um, connected up together. So they're not separate like we've done, right? We don't have a separate centrifugal switch contact like terminals, separate capacitor terminals. It's five and eight that are together. So that means that current would be going from line to neutral through the start winding when the switch is closed. So this should actually be drawn like this in the closed position because that would be the rest state for that guy. Um, and that would be it, right? As soon as you hook this up, it should work properly. Um, the issue is, is that um, it may blow the fuse, or in our case, uh, the breaker, right? So when I did this project 20 years ago, um, my shop teacher, who was phenomenal, my shop teacher was absolutely phenomenal, and I, I owe him everything. Like he was the, the coordinator for the department, then he was the chair for all of CCT, uh, and then he's the gentleman that hired me. Um, so I owe him everything. But as my shop teacher, man, did he piss me off because he left me to flounder on this, uh, this circuit and I could not figure out what was going on. I couldn't figure out what was going on because he had drawn this diagram out and I wired up exactly the same as he had on the, on the board. And every time that I turned the, the, the circuit on, it blew the breaker every single time. I would wire it up, <clears throat> blow the breaker. I'd check everything, right? Check all these connections. I'd have, all right, one, eight, and three together. I got four, two, and five together. I went back and I checked all my resistance values. I'm like, okay, let's try this again. I turn on, <clears throat> blow the fuse again. And I get pissed off and I would rip everything out and I would rewire the whole thing. And I'd be like, oh my God, let, let's see if it works this time. And I was taking time, I literally took three different days in order to finish this project. The other people in my shop class were losing their minds because there was only two or three of these stations and everybody was lined up behind Pete Vree saying, come on, let's get this done. What are you doing? And I was, I don't understand. I do understand every single, turn, every single time I turn this on, I blow the fuse and I went to my shop teacher and he's like, you got to figure it out yourself. Like just based on what we talked about in class, I'm like, I have everything you talked about in class. I have a diagram. He's like, make it work, dude, make it work. It's your issue, you wired it up, make it work. 
<laughs> ripped it out again, rewired it again, turned on the breaker, boom, blew the breaker again. I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna lose my mind. So pause the video here. What did I screw up? What did I screw up on this circuit in that every single time I turned the breaker on, I blew the breaker. Everything was exactly the same as how he had drawn it in class. I checked the resistance winding. I checked that everything was in parallel. But every single time that I turned the breaker on, I blew the fuse. Okay, you didn't pause. You just waited for the answer. But pause the video. Think about it. Try and try and think this through. What would blow the fuse uh, when this in this circuit? I didn't have a line to neutral connection. Like I didn't short out from line to neutral. I messed up polarities. What I did was I messed up this polarity right here. This second winding I put in with this as three and this as four. Because I didn't know which one was three. I didn't know which, which one was four. I didn't know which one was one. I didn't know, know which one is two. I can't tell that with a nine volt battery on the meter. I just can, I can tell a resistance reading, but I can't tell a polarity reading on the winding. So I went and connected up this winding reversed. These two windings, run A and run B, have the exact same resistance. They have the exact same XL value. They are identical, they are twins. Okay, so that means that they have the exact same magnetic field. So if I hook up those two windings magnetically so that they cancel each other out, then all of a sudden I'm only left with the small amount of resistance on those run windings. If we go back to here, the run winding resistance is like 2.9, right? But I have them in parallel. So essentially, let's, let's call it three ohms, right? Each run, resist, run winding resistance is three ohms. I have them connected in parallel. So my total resistance with there in parallel is 1.5 ohms, right? So what I did was I connected these two windings so that their polarity was opposite of each other. The resistance value is 1.5 ohms, and I just put 120 volts across there. So 120 volt here, let's grab your, grab your calculator. And we got 120 volts, and we got a, a whopping 1.5 ohms, right? So we're doing 120 divided by 1.5, I got 80 amps flowing through those windings. No wonder he thought it was a donkey, right? I got 80 amps flowing through there and it blows the breaker every single time. So how are you gonna do this so you don't blow the breaker and look like a dumbass like I did? Remember we, could, we hooked up the DC motors when we were doing the, um, the series connection and then we did the shunt connection, and then we looked at the, the way that they were running and which direction they were running. We can do the same thing with this motor. I know this is a long video, I apologize, but, um, but I don't apologize. We're covering some really good material here. So um, what you wanna do is you want to hook up this, if you hook up both windings together and it works, awesome, you just won the lottery, right? It was a 50-50 chance whether it was gonna work. Try this, instead of just hoping whether it's gonna work, don't connect that run winding B. Only hook up run winding A and look to see which direction the motor is actually spinning. So we're gonna say maybe it's turning in a clockwise direction. Okay, so I'm only hooking up run winding A, I'm not hooking up run winding B, and I'm turning the power on and seeing which way it turns. In this case, it's turning in a clockwise direction. Okay, then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to disconnect uh, the run winding A and I'm gonna connect up run winding B. Okay, so that means that I have this one out of the circuit. I now bring run winding B into the circuit and based off of this arbitrary number that I put here for three and this arbitrary number here that I put for four, I look at which way it's turning. In this case, I win the lottery again, and it's going in the same direction. If it was going in a counterclockwise direction, then this is four and this is three. Okay, you have to make sure that they go in the same direction. That means that both magnetic fields are exactly the same. Excellent, so that means that 
we have hooked up these guys so they have the exact same magnetic polarity they're not going to cancel each other out and the breaker is not going to blow now when you listen to this motor it should run smoothly okay if it runs really loud that means you messed up if it sounds like ducks like it's going quack, 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 that means that you have the start and the run windings mixed up okay it should sound smooth it should say make minimal amount of noise and you're going to take the meter and you're going to test out with the the high voltage gloves right um, you're going to test out the uh, the voltage cross three and four see if you have 120 one and two see if you have 120 and you're not going to be able to see this voltage because it's going to be there and then as soon as the motor gets up to 75 percent of its speed it's going to be gone so we're going to just test out the voltage across each of those two windings there hook up these these windings so that they're in parallel right make sure that it runs uh properly okay then once everything's runs properly and the motor sounds cool then you're going to you know write down the fact that this is one this is two this is three and this is four we've seen that the magnetic polarity is exactly the same between these two and we're good to go to move on to the next project okay the next project is to put these guys across a two eight volt source okay but be careful with these then that you don't have the magnetic field going in the opposite direction right the other story with uh, that teacher who became like what he, he became one of my mentors um but during class like first day he's like um he's like peter vray and like put my hand up i'm like no it's peter vree he's like no it's peter vray and I, i'm like i'm very quiet individual and I'm still very very much an introvert um but i'm like i get a little bit mad and i said no it's, it's actually peter vree and he looks at me across the room and he goes, no, it's actually Peter Vray. I'm like, what is going on? Who does this guy think he is? He's like, it's probably Peter Devray. And I'm like, what do you, what do you, no, my name is Peter Vree. He's like, no, your name is Peter Vray. I was like losing my, my mind. He's like, when you go home, ask your dad why he changed your name when he came to Canada. I was like, oh. Like now that would be grounds for dismissal, right? And I was like, what is going on? Who has, who says those things, right? Um, and so I went home and I asked my dad, but I phoned him up and I'm like, dude, when you came to Canada, did you change your name? He's like, oh yeah, for sure. What are you, what are you talking about? I'm like, what's our last name? He's like, it's, uh, it's like, it's Vri, but it's probably pronounced Vray uh, back in Holland. And I'm like, so your name is Frank Vri, but what's your real name? He's like, oh, my real name is France Frederikus Vray. I'm like, oh my goodness. So I always thought that my last name was Vray. My last name is actually Vray. Um, and it was only this gentleman who actually clued me into the fact that uh, most people when they come to Canada are forced to change their name to become more Canadian or to sound more Canadian, which is absolutely uh, ridiculous. But I was like flabbergasted when he said that. Um, so he just, he was not my, my favorite teacher whatsoever when I had him. Uh, but it's, it's amazing because later in life, I like, there's probably very few other people that I respect more than that gentleman. Okay. So moving on, um, story time with Pete. Uh, the next thing we need to do is connect this guy up in the high voltage connection. Okay. So now we're going to go for the high voltage connection. Um, We've already figured out that this is one and this is two, right? So the magnetic field is going here. This is three and this is four. Make sure you write those down because that would suck when you go from the low voltage to the high voltage connection and you pop the breaker again, right? Because again, in this case, if you connect the, these guys up so that these two magnetic fields cancel each other out, uh, then you would have twice the resistance. Our resistance was uh, basically three ohms. So now we got six ohms of resistance uh, across 208. So if we cancel those guys out, 208 divided by six ohms, we have 35, 35 amps that's going to flow in that circuit. Still going to break, going to blow the breaker. Okay. So keep in mind that one is still here, two is here, three is here, four is here. And these polarities need to be in the same direction in order to make this guy work. Now to finish this off, we need to start winding in parallel with one of the run windings. 
okay? This start winding is only good for 120 volts, right? This voltage is most likely, most likely gonna be 104, but the voltage rating, like how much voltage it can actually take before it smokes is 120. So if we put 28, like if we put this guy right across the source, then all of a sudden smoke and a pancake and the white smoke comes out, okay? So we need to make sure that it's either in parallel with one run winding or the other run winding. In this case, the diagram is showing us that we need to put, um, looks like three, eight, uh, and two together there. So in this case, the, uh, the run winding is gonna be across uh, the second, sorry, the start winding is gonna be, going to be across the, the second uh, run winding, right? This is run winding A, and this is run winding B, okay? Remember that, things in parallel are going to have the identical voltage. So we could have put it across here, right? So our centrifugal switch and our capacitor and our start winding could have gone across here in parallel. And that way that we would have 104 across run to winding A and 104 across our start winding. But in this case, the diagram is showing us that we're putting it across the other run winding, okay? So one or the other run winding. Make that way you will ensure that the start winding only gets 104 volts in that circuit. Okay, long video guys. We have gone through um, the different components in the motor uh, and we've gone through the resistance readings on the 10 different terminals. Then we went through the connections for the low voltage connection and now we've gone through the connections for the high voltage connection in that the run windings are in series and the start winding in this case is across the run winding B here, okay? Hopefully everything's made sense. If you've gone this far in the video, I truly appreciate it. Thanks very much for listening to Storytime with Pete and following through from start to finish here. Hopefully every, everything makes sense. Uh, and now when you're in front of this particular project, you're gonna rock through and you're not gonna take three days like I did to get through this circuit. All right guys, thanks very much for your patience. We'll see you guys on the next video.